for those who don't know me, my name's Richard Betts. Um, I'm group publisher and co-founder at, uh, at Real Asset Media. And we run around kind of uh, actually around 80 of these sessions a, a year, probably, um, as well as sessions at, at Expo Real and upcoming at, at MIPIM 2022. Um, really interesting panel there. Um, so let, let's Let's pick up on some introductions. We, we've obviously got Serge Baconnier, who's Deputy Head of the Paris Office for, for Berlin HIP. We've got uh, Irina Pilipchuk, who's the Director of Research and Market Information for InRev. Thomas, who we already know, who's partner, uh, but leader of real estate and real assets uh, for PwC out of Germany. Um, and last but very much not least, Megan Walters, who's global head of research for Allianz Real Estate. Um, so we have somebody based in London, somebody based in Frankfurt, somebody based in Paris, and Arena, who is kind of based everywhere, but between, <laughs> but between Amsterdam and, uh, and Frankfurt at various points. Um, let's just do kind of brief introduction. Serge, let's start with you. Um, just to Quick introduction of, of, of yourself, I suppose, and, and, and the company. Yes, hi, Richard. Thank you for, for inviting us uh, on this, on this uh, interesting uh, panel. Um, and um, and hi, to, hi to everyone. Uh, as a brief introduction, I, I started to work uh, five years ago in the French office of uh, Berlin Hip. Uh, Berlin Hip is, um, is one of the, the biggest uh, mortgage lender uh, in Germany. Uh, it has a, a local presence in all the, the German markets, obviously, uh, in France, in uh, the Netherlands, uh, well, Benelux uh, more generally, and uh, Czech and Poland, Czech Republic and Poland. Uh, the bank is active in commercial real estate, in, uh, in the office, uh, logistics, retail, as well as in the re residential, uh, residential market, uh, mainly in uh, Germany and Holland. Uh, our portfolio is uh, split 40% in offices, uh, residential 30%, retail 16 and 6% in logistics. So pre pretty much uh, diversified with a strong focus on, uh, on offices and uh, residential. Uh, we produced 6 billion euro of uh, new loans in 2021. So a strong, uh, strong activity. And interestingly, um, so one third was done outside uh, Germany, just to, to show that we have a European uh, reach. And interestingly, we, uh, we issued loans for, with 40% of uh, green assets. So it's maybe part of the interesting discussion topics that we will, um, uh, we will, uh, we will have today. Um, we have, uh, with Berlin a very strong focus on, uh, on the green aspect on ESG uh, topics following the, the trends of uh, investors uh, today. And we are also one of the, um, the main uh, green bond uh, issuer, uh, Berlin Hip. We are very innovative and uh, we have, uh, for instance, we have um, issued the first taxonomy uh, conformed green bond uh, beginning of this year. And we have a, a general target of having one third of our, our portfolio uh, in, in green assets. So a strong focus on, on this uh, for, for the next year, for the coming years. Yeah, that's really interesting. We'll definitely dig down into that ESG side and the, and the green financing side. Um, Megan, quick introduction of, of yourself and Allianz. Thanks, Richard. Again, thank you for having me here today. Um, my name's Megan Walters. And by background, I'm a UK trained chartered surveyor, but I've spent most of I've spent most of my working career uh, actually in Asia Pacific. I did my PhD in Hong Kong and I taught at a university there. And most recently I've spent 14 years in Singapore where for the last 10, I worked for JLL um, in capital markets and in research. I joined Allianz Real Estate two years ago, um, actually just at the start of the pandemic. So it's been an interesting two years working remotely. I've relocated back to the UK um, and I'm looking forward to going to MIPIM. So I hope to see some people there. In terms of Allianz Real Estate, we represent 37 pools of capital for the Allianz Insurance Group. Um, so primarily uh, Europe focused, about 70% of the portfolio focused at Europe and about 15% to the US and Asia Pacific. We have about 75 billion in terms of assets under management. Um, about half of that is equity, a little over half of that is equity, um, about 22 billion in debt and about 15%, uh, sorry, 15 billion in indirect. Um, we're long-term core investors, so we're looking for returns sort of four to six percent. Um, the new news, or sort of relatively recent news, is that we've joined up with PIMCO, which is a 2.2 trillion 
bond fund. So as much as we think we're quite big in the world of real estate with our 80 billion, when you put that alongside 2.2 trillion um, in bonds, it kind of sets the whole thing into perspective. Um, and so that means that we're looking, we're working more with uh, third party investors um, into the world of real estate alongside the insurance companies that we traditionally represent. Super. Thanks very much. Um, and Irina, over to you and a brief introduction of yourself and InRev. Thank you, Richard. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Irina Polipchuk, and I'm Director of Research and Market Information at InRev. InRev is European uh, associations uh, for non-listed real estate funds, uh, whose key mission is to provide transparency, standardization, and insight onto European non-listed real estate markets. Uh, we have a substantive suite of indices, uh, market insights, and topical papers to really provide key information to help that decision-making um, process in the market, and also have a very ambitious global agenda working together with our global partners, Unrev, NACREF, and PRIA uh, across the world. Uh, so I will be here sharing some of the big picture industry view uh, with the panelists and the attendees. Thank you. Super. Thanks very much. And uh, and Thomas, over to you. Um, just brief introduction of uh, of, of yourself and uh, PwC. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Richard. So my name is Thomas. I'm partner located in Frankfurt, responsible for the real assets industry, covering infrastructure and real estate in Germany, and part of our global global team in real estate. Around four thousand people globally in each territory. Um, helping our clients with typical deals, consulting services, tax services, and audit services. So, um, and, and of course, some of the big topics currently that driving our business on top of the usual business is the digitalization, as well as, of course, e the questions around ESG we will discuss later. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Thanks, Thomas. Um, and uh, thanks very much to everybody for joining. Um, if you've got questions or comments, um, you can put those into the Q&A or the comment side, which is just on the right hand side of your screen. Um, and you can also download um, the, uh, the presentation from Thomas there if you want to take a look at those slides. Um, those are there also on the files section. Um, so do feel free to use that. And I'll be monitoring those and picking up your questions and make sure we ask those as well. Um, Megan, it might be interesting just to start um, in terms of, I suppose, the, the macro side, um, what are you seeing in terms of that macro side, um, economics, global? Um, what have you seen over 2021 and, and how do you see that for 2022? Thanks, Richard. So I'd like to start by building on uh, Thomas's point about business confidence, which I think is was a terrific start. So great presentation and a terrific start to the panel to say that real estate markets are actually really quite confident. Um, if we look at, we, we have seen peak policy support and therefore probably peak GDP growth um, most recently last year as we come out of the pandemic. Um, so we don't forecast GDP. We use the numbers out of Allianz, a group economics for the insurance firm and indeed PIMCO. So we spend a lot of time looking at both of those sets of numbers. Um, the numbers here today, I'm just gonna use the IMF numbers because they were just released last week. So last year, global GDP growth at 5.9% for 2021. This year, it's going to be 4.4% as we come out of the pandemic and we come out of that policy support. And then next year, 3.8%, which is moving towards the sort of long-term average of 3.1% that we expect for uh, global GDP growth. So to just to pick up on some numbers, what we have seen is actually a little bit of ratcheting back in terms of people's GDP expectations, um, just sort of a slight downgrade. So the IMF downgraded the US outlook just marginally. It's, it's now looking at sort of 4% for the US down from 5.25. Um, similarly, Euro uh, GDP forecast at 4%, again, sort of slightly down from 4.4, and the UK similar at 4.7% down from 5%. So there has been a little bit of ratcheting back. Now that's because the variant Omicron has carried on for longer than people might have expected. Um, and so some of that growth that you might've been expecting now has been pushed out slightly later. I think one of the areas where there's quite a lot of sort of divergence between people's views is around China. Um, the IMF forecasting things like 8% growth for China. Um, some of the other commentators actually bringing that back to more like 5.5%. So I'm, I'm always 
fairly positive on China. Um, we have the common prosperity policy uh, where Xi Jinping is looking to kind of even up um, prosperity. I think it's a theme actually sort of globally where all governments are looking to almost prioritize people prioritise employment, uh, make sure that things feel fair, that everybody is lifted together, um, a rising tide lifting all boats together. So if we had to kind of sort of summarise what we think might happen going forward. Central banks, the Fed in particular, has a twin mandate of employment stability, um, full employment and price stability. And I think the Fed and, and many other uh, banks and governments will be looking to kind of prioritise people as full employment. Um, one of the effects of that might be is actually moderately higher inflation moving forward, but actually um, sort of stronger economic activity. With inflation coming forward, and I know we'll talk a lot more about this, um, we expect real interest rates to remain low. It, I, you know, people are talking about, is it three Fed rate rises or is it five Fed rate rises across the coming year? Whatever the number is in terms of the rate rises, will central banks be able to lift interest rates fast enough and high enough to account for inflation and um, we may think they may not which means that we will continue to see real interest rates being very low now that means investors will divert money to real estate and i know irena will talk about the investor intention survey so money will continue to flow to real estate um, risks on the horizon, obviously geopolitical around energy costs, um, what happens to energy pricing and how governments handle the effect of energy and food inflation on populations globally. So, Richard, I'll stop there. No, that's great. Thanks very much, Megan. And maybe that's a, maybe that's a good opportunity to come to you, Irina, and just pick up on, on, I suppose, what the investors are saying in terms of their intentions there. Yes, indeed. I think I would echo what both Thomas and Megan has already mentioned with regards to the business confidence and allocations to the real estate. Uh, we just released a couple of weeks ago our annual investment intention study. Uh, it's a global study. And we've, been, we've been doing it for over 15 years now, and uh, the sentiment is very strong. 61% uh, of all the, the investors globally are actually expecting to increase their allocations to real estate further in the next two years. And uh, there is quite a significant 120 basis points gap between the current average allocations globally and the target average allocations. Uh, that's 8.9% uh, versus 10.1%. Uh, uh, target. So that's quite a significant gap and is actually a little bit above uh, what we have seen over the last five years or so, which tended to be uh, over and around 80 basis points. Uh, that gap is a little bit lower for Europe. And as we know, uh, a lot of European investors are already very heavily invested in the real estate as an asset class, but that upward shift and allocation is very much clear. I think what I see in the sentiment and coming back to the COVID point that Mega uh, was referring to, uh, when we asked the question around to what extent the investment plans for 2022 are affected by COVID, quite a notable 45-48% of Asia-Pacific investors and North American investors said their uh, plans were impacted, uh, but that share was much lower for European investors only at around 30%. So I think more good news uh, for Europe from that respect as well. Okay, great. I mean, <clears throat> it'd be good to pick up from you, Serge, I think just um, just what you are seeing from the financing banking perspective. Yeah, maybe uh, generally picking up on, the, on those topics, I think we are coming out from uh, one year, well, in 2020, a very difficult year. I think 2021, um, there were a lot of uncertainties and in the end i think it it remained uh, a very very good year for for real estate um if we look at uh, i mean some some figures have started to come out for for the, the total year and we see that uh, international investors in europe have uh, have still uh, i mean have have increased there is uh, more than 250 billion uh, uh uh, investments in real estate uh, in Europe, uh, out of which uh, around half of it is, is, is coming from the US. So we see that uh, the European uh, real estate market is still uh, attracting a lot of international investors. And I think that's, that's a very positive message for, for the future. 
we see also uh, Asian actors who had uh, withdrawn in 2020, at least from the, what I've seen in the, in the Parisian uh, market. They have started to, uh, to, to come back already in 2021 and uh, surely for, for the, the coming year. So I would say, uh, first, a, a very positive um, general um, assessment on, uh, on what we, we can expect for 2022. And uh, as mentioned, a, a good uh, and positive sentiment uh, business-wise. I mean, the, 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 the unemployment rate is, uh, is going down uh, in France and I think in Europe uh, as, a, as a whole. And uh, that there is um, GDP growth uh, everywhere. So uh, I think that that's one of the, the big uh, message today is, uh, is the positive aspects and, and the impact also on the, on the real estate market. Uh, we indeed see uh, increased um, uh, interest rates, even though the, the, the European Central Bank still has a, an easement uh, uh, strategy. So uh, in, in the end, I think that the real estate market remains uh, very interesting for, for, for investors when we compare to, uh, to the bond market. So uh, there is still a gap that, that, uh, that makes uh, real estate uh, an attractive uh, sector for, for, for investors. So uh, maybe afterwards we can we can go uh, more deeper in the, in the different asset classes. Uh, maybe one one thing to uh, already to to mention uh, for us uh, the office market is uh, remains the major market uh, to uh, to to be looked at uh, in terms of volumes, obviously. And we have seen, as uh, already picked up by Thomas, that there has been a lot of interest in, uh, in the logistics uh, following up with the, the, the e-commerce uh, trends. Um, there has been a big push from, uh, uh, from the U.S. investors, typically in France, for, for portfolios and also on the last mile strategies uh, following uh, the, the Amazon strategy to, uh, to have uh, assets in uh, different locations. One of, yeah, the, big, I'll, one of I'll, the big aspects maybe uh, also on, on the real estate is the current very low uh, yield environment. Uh, we have uh, across, across the assets, which is pretty new, uh, uh, yields around 3%, uh, I would say, uh, to be very uh, general. Uh, that's, uh, that's a low level and sometimes uh, even below for, for, for the office market. So for us, um, maybe just to give you our sentiment on the, on the banking side, we will remain cautious on uh, LTVs. Uh, maybe that's why also Thomas mentioned the, the, the attractiveness uh, of the market for, for Mets, uh, Mets players, uh, which can uh, maybe fill the gap if uh, investors want uh, higher LTVs. Okay, that's great. Um, I just wanted to pick up a, a couple of questions that there were um, coming into the um, into the feed there. One from uh, Arno, thanks for that, which is um, impact of NASDAQ strong corrections, question mark. So if anybody wants to pick up that, feel free to. Um, but also another one from um, Tristan Frost there about political risk, but particularly picking up um, Ukraine. Um, so I, I don't know whether anybody wants to pick up that sort of geopolitical risk side um, and also the stock market side of things. I can make a point about the stock markets. I'm not sure if it's a direct link to just the Nasdaq, but what we are seeing is a real shift in terms of intentions for the next two year allocations towards non-listed real estate boss funds, uh, but also different structures such as club deals, joint ventures, uh, other partnership, uh, the combined uh, combination of the two now stands at about 70% of new allocations in the next two years. Uh, that's an increase of about 20% compared to last year and very much at the expense of less allocations to other, particularly the direct and the listed market. So we see that in the sentiment. Uh, perhaps one or two comments also from a diversification point of view. I think it, it answers both points, geopolitical as well as the stock market. I think if, um, if, if, for the, if there is volatility or uncertainty in the market shown by high volatility in the equity markets, uh, it's always positive to be, to also have a higher allocation to real assets. It's one thing and the same we have seen if the pa in the past, if you have geopolitical risks coming up on the horizon, there's always a flight to quality, to core markets. Um, that's something we have seen in the last 25 years. So I would say that all uh, is positive 
for our industry. But <clears throat> I think one of the key challenges in our industry is that it's all positive and it's positive for the last 10 to 15 years. So it's all doing well and we are all outperforming our plans, but <laughs> that also comes with some challenges because the key changes we have to do, the transformation on ESG, on digital, the people transformation, we are still lagging if you compare it with other industries like the banking industries, which is hardly under pressure for a couple of years, but you also see the changes and what, what happens. So that's, it, it's all positive and I, I like to be in a sector which is, which is growing fast and have a big allocation. But again, it's coming with a bit to long-term challenges, um, which we have to tackle and have to keep in mind. Yeah. Um, and is there is there a view about you know maybe bonds becoming more attractive if we do get interest rates, interest rate rises, and inflation? Um, and also, I suppose, what's the impact of that inflation? Because we haven't seen really inflation particularly looking at European markets for quite a considerable time. And so it'd be interesting. Um, Megan, have you, you've been doing some, some data on that, I think. Yeah, thanks, Richard. Yes, I, I'd be happy to take that one up. So UK inflation highest in 30 years, US inflation highest in nearly 40 years, um, 39 years, I, I think the headline was that I saw the other day. So we, it's quite hard to get real estate data over really long time periods. And in your opening, and Thomas also referred to it, to what degree is real estate a decent hedge against inflation? Um, and some of it comes to where in the cycle do you invest as to how well you do at the end of the inflationary period? And so the answer is to look as long as you can. So we've got five cities globally where we can get data back over 40 years. London, New York, Paris, Frankfurt and Sydney. Um, other locations like well, Shanghai. So China joined the World Trade Organization in 2001. So you can't go far enough back because the environment is too different. Um, Tokyo, we had a, a the, obviously the stock market crash and the Tokyo bubble crash back in 1989. So that data becomes murky. And places like the Berlin, you know, that, that again had a different sort of economic environment um, back over a 40 year time period. So really only five markets globally where the external environment is stable enough to be able to sort of look at inflation and measure it. So there's sort of two things, two components to this. What does inflation do to the rent and what does inflation do to yield or capital value and therefore the yield? So let's start with the rent side. If you look back over a 40 year time period, you can see that rent in the long run do broadly keep up with the consumer price index. So the consumer price index sits in a nice sort of line moving upwards and you're, I'm doing diagrams on the screen with my fingers, um, you can see the supply and demand cycle sitting on top of it. So what happens to your rent depends where in the supply and demand cycle you buy. But if you assume that you're buying sort of mid-cycle on supply and demand, over a 40-year time period, your rents do keep up with inflation. So, so but, it, 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 but that's sort of an overall market average. When you look at real estate yields, real estate yields are net of inflation. So if you've got a building that gives you five units a year and it costs you 100 units to buy, it's a 5% yield. If everything in the market doubles, so rents double, capital values double, then it's still producing a 5% yield. So real estate yields are real net of inflation. And so when we then look at, well, what does that mean? Should we be investing in real estate? What we need to look at is, what is the return on the bond market net of inflation? So what is the real risk-free rate or what is the real bond rate after inflation? And we compare that number to the real estate yield because the real estate yield is also net of inflation. It's a real yield. And what we find is back many, many years ago when I went to university, we were always taught that the spread between the real risk-free rate and, say, the London office market should be about 350 basis points. Now, this was kind of a known piece of information back before we had Excel spreadsheets. It was just kind of, it was a, a sort of a long-term number, 350 basis points. What we've done is looking at these 40-year time cycles, we can see that over a 40-year time number that we did, the average of these five global markets is actually 360 basis points, which we were amazed at because it does sit in line with this kind of known long-term number. 
The current average spread is actually 515 basis points. For places like London, it's actually 650 basis points difference between what you get if you invest in bonds after inflation versus what you would get in the real estate markets. And so these super wide spreads, much, much wider than the long term average, means that real interest rates can actually move up quite a long way before it starts to affect what you would get in terms of or before it would start to make real estate be less attractive because it sits so far beyond its long-term 40-year average. Um, so with that, we expect money to continue to flow into real estate. If anybody's interested in those numbers, do please get in touch. Um, there's an article out there in the public domain that we'd be happy to share. Great. Thanks, Megan. Um, it'd be interesting, I, I think, to, to pick up as well. Um, Irina, what, what are you seeing in terms of the capital intentions? Um, Thomas mentioned there as well the likelihood of more um, Asian capital coming through. Um, are you seeing anything from the InRev data about the, you know, what you're expecting in terms of capital? In yeah, sure. I mean, there is a lot of interesting insights, but maybe if I just pick up on the inflation point, because I agree entirely with Megan, because it's a very complex. We know that real estate is inflation sensitive, but the speed of that coming through into the income stream varies a lot. Uh, depending on the lease structure, market, holding period. So it's very difficult to generalize. And I think investors recognize because we asked the question around, you know, what are the key reasons for investing in real estate? Uh, and we've been asking that for, uh, you know, 15 years now. And uh, it's it, quite amazing how consistent uh, the answers are, even this year, when the inflationary pressures, it really is so topical here in Europe, it's gone up a little bit in terms of the scoring, but it's still ranked the least important because in the greater scheme of things, investor decision-making is still around the benefits and the diversification benefits of real estate as an asset class and multi-asset portfolio. And I just wanted to highlight. In terms of uh, differences in capital, well, about 40% of new uh, capital is targeting Europe. So I think Europe is definitely remains to be a sweet spot. Uh, I think one of the key message in terms of that confidence coming back is that actually if you look at the style of new allocations, there has been a real shift towards more value add opportunities when it comes to new capital. Uh, 57% of new allocations in the next two years are targeting value add. That's quite an uptick from about 37% uh, apologies last year, which is actually a continuation of the longer term trend where investors, you know, given the hot market that we've had for a decade now, and I, I really concur with Thomas on this, and investors have been struggling to source product, you know, to, to, to find the right yield. And only last year there was a you know, a blip, it was the focus on core and that rapid shift on core because there was so much uncertainty in the market. All of that is reversed now and we have a really strong confidence towards value add. And when we look at also the shift in terms of preference by investors, particularly the European investors, we see seen much broader selection of markets and sectors that European investors in particular are targeting when it comes to Europe including now Spain moving up into the fourth position after France, Germany and the UK in that order, but also Nordic markets and Italy. But when it comes to the non-European investors, they are still quite skewed to the larger markets. Uh, so, you know, UK is uh, still a hot spot for them, Germany, France, even in the logistics markets, for example, we see a little bit of softening in sentiment. It's in the first place overall when it comes to European capital expectations for new investments. But the European investors are a little bit more timid because I think they are recognizing the, the, the level of yields that we are at, where the cross-regional investors are very hot on you know, France industrial logistics, German industrial logistics, and so on. So I think there are quite different dimensions between European local investors and the non-Europeans, which is, uh, I'm sure we'll explore in more detail in a little while. Great. It'd be, it'd be interesting just to drill down a little bit into each of those markets, I think. Um, Serge, just, just briefly update us a bit on the, on the French market there. Um, 
what are you seeing in terms of some of the some of the sectors? Yeah, maybe uh, picking up on what uh, Irina just said, um, I, I've seen some uh, some data also mentioning that uh, um, in France, for instance, the, the, the value core plus value add um, was representing fifty percent of the uh, of the market for, for the office sector. So it's true to say that uh, currently there, there is a, a, a big push on, on those uh, those topics. I think we we. We have to look at it maybe uh, with the, um, the perspective of the ESG uh, agenda and all the, um, the topics around uh, having green assets. Uh, I think this is really the hot topic. I mean, it's being discussed in every uh, every panel, and uh, it has a big, big impact on uh, on uh, investors' choices and how banks uh, also uh, follow uh, follow investors. So it has a twofold uh, impact. I think for investors, um, it, it gives uh, a push to uh, or a fly fly to to quality. Um, either looking at um, at core assets, uh, these assets need to be already uh, with uh, good good labels uh, and good um, environmental uh, criteria. And uh, on the other side, it, it pushes investors to uh, to uh, to look at uh, assets to be uh, repositioned or to be uh, Redeveloped or to develop new assets, so that's maybe why also the the, the value add core plus sector has uh, has expanded um, recently, and maybe this is a a trend that will will follow uh, in the coming years. Um, it has a, a strong impact, I think, on the on the different yields uh, between the, the, the different um, type of assets, meaning there that. Uh, if the asset has all the good labels, uh, you will uh, continue to pay a, a, a price for it. But it also has a big impact for uh, more obsolete or, or stranded assets, which uh, will be uh, difficult to um, to invest in and, and to, to finance uh, in, the, in the future. So I think that's uh, one of the, the big impact of all the ESG uh, agenda for the, for the coming years. Uh, and on the banking side, uh, obviously, and we see it uh, at Berlin IP, uh, I mean, I mean, ESG uh, having a scoring, we have a scoring grid for, for ESG and we have to uh, to provide these in, in our committees. So it's really part of the decision process to, uh, to follow uh, clients and uh, investments uh, in, in assets. So uh, I think this is one of the, the, the big topics uh, that we will have to, to follow up on uh, for, for, for 2022. Um, and, it, and, and more broadly, Serge, do you, do you expect there to be kind of stranded assets in, in the French market there that that can't get financing, that don't meet the ESG criteria? Well, I don't get financing uh, when you look at uh, conservative banks. Maybe there are some players that will uh, have a look at it, but uh, but uh, investors will have to pay the price for it because the debt, uh, uh, well, the, the, the pricing for it will be uh, much different. Okay, good. And and Thomas, you know, ESG. There's there's been a lot of discussion around it. It seems to me that everybody is now talking about now is the time to act, as opposed to talk about it. Um, I suppose. Do you do you see 2022 being that year of of greater action? Um, I suppose. What what are the challenges there, and and is the industry really ready to act? Uh, that's, <clears throat> that's a good question. And definitely, since last year, we've seen significant increase in the consultancy business also in the ESG due diligence business helping our clients to 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 be more ESG compliant but there's still the uncertainty um, what exactly do we have to do I think most of the players have ESG on their agenda uh, the majority has defined their ESG strategy but now it comes down to the details yeah do we do we do we really have the data on the existing stock to measure the, especially the EPs, which is, the, let's, I would say, from a measuring point of view, the easiest one. With SNG, it gets a bit more tricky. <clears throat> That's where the implementation phase is now, and the banks are asking questions from a lending side. Insurers are asking, and my my feeling uh, is that maximum 50% of the questions are answered because the data is just not there. And um, I think if we discuss the institutional market here with having Berli Hüpp and Allianz um, here on the, and, and um, INREF, of course, we are mainly talking about the newer office tower in London, Frankfurt, Paris, which is, I would say, from an e-perspective, an, an easy one. 
I'm not sure about the S1, if you go into supply chain, the production process, et cetera. But the key challenge is that the existing stock, the 95 plus percent of existing assets, which we which are which do not have sensors to measure the ESG and the energy output, but also have the social uh, the, the, the measuring the social impact and having the gov governance in place. That's the key issues. And then talking about investment opportunities, I think that's the big the renovation wave we have to we have to do. And um, in Europe, we are still front runner um, from the transformational point of view, but we are still at the beginning. But if you compare that with the US or with uh, countries in Asia, there is no regulator pushing as hard as in Europe. And we are still not fast enough in Europe. If you see the past, we are we are still um, going to two two and a half percent uh, increase in temperature. We try to get, go down to one point five percent, and we have we need more and more significant relevant transformation in that piece. Only looking at climate, and climate is only one piece of ESG. So yes, we have to do a lot more and it has to come from the regulator because the market is not able to solve that problem. It, it has to be under pressure to be honest. I'm personally not a friend of regulation, but um, um, so in the mid and long term, the, the, let's say the transformation has to go back to market mechanisms. But for now, I think it can only come from the regulator and we see have the new government in Germany also try to push hard, but in detail, it's difficult if you increase rents in the cities because you increase um, the energy costs, it, there's a potential for for social pressure coming from the people who have to pay. So it's it's really a complex issue, but we have to solve it. Yeah, we are with 40% of CO2 emission, 50% of waste. Uh, we, we use so many, so many um, um, products for, for the construction. So we are very relevant. I don't want to be, I don't want to say we are a problem, <clears throat> but we, we are also part of the solution or we can be a part of the solution. We have to do that. So, um, but there's a lot, lot more to do and it will cost money. Megan, you are. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Megan, you wanted to come in on that. Yes, I did. So uh, Thomas is entirely right. Um, completely right. I'm probably a tiny bit more optimistic in that I think that some of the large occupations Hires are very much pushing towards being net carbon neutral. So lots, you know, we Allianz will say we, you know, we're part of the Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance. We want to be net carbon neutral by 2050. We're committed on science-based targets to reducing our carbon emissions in our portfolio um, by 25% by 2025. So you know, we've got we've got metrics in place. Um, I think a lot of the push will come from large occupiers who want to attract young talent and to be seen as occupiers that care about ESG, I think will then help push our industry in the right direction. Um, I, I, Thomas is entirely right in everything you said about it. It, it does need some government backing to that, but I, I, I'm probably yeah, a bit more optimistic that it will be the large occupiers that help. The one downside to this is that in terms of refurbishing assets, which because of embedded carbon, it's clearly the best way to go rather than demolishing and rebuilding. In terms of refurbishing, the maths simply works better in high rent cities. If it costs about the same to reclad a building, whether you're in a city with lower rent or in a city with higher rent, then it means that the higher rent cities, you, your payback is quicker because, you know, you've, you've got further to go with it. So I think it does leave a problem for some locations, but I think within a city, what it will mean is that the assets in the heart of the city, where the rents the highest, are the ones that are likely to see the refurbishment first. And what it's going to do, back to the, the point about stranded assets, it will be the suburban assets in the periphery that will really suffer most. Um, that's great. Thanks. Thanks. I'll come to you in a second, Arena. Um, quickly, Megan, as well. There's uh, even Zhao have both put in the in the chat. Where can they get your research um, on inflation that that came from? Is that sure. on your site? Um, yeah, it's it's on um, IPE. There's a link to IPE. Um, so, so without wanting to talk about somebody else's platform, uh, there's a link about IPE um, where it's on the public domain website if they Google for that. Um, and if they can't find it via you, please get in touch and we'll make sure they get a copy. That's fine. And if you let me know the link, then I'll share that with everybody as well. So that's That'd great. That'd be great. All right. Super. Thanks, Richard. Good. Um, 
it would be interesting just to pick up on some of the sectors, I think. Um, uh, sorry, Rina, you wanted to come back in that, on that point first. Just very quickly, I'm aware of the time, but I wanted to share some of Megan's optimism because we were lucky as an Inverev to host the Autumn Conference in November in Copenhagen, where more than 300 attendees gathered for two days to talk about ESG only. And the sentiment in the room was no longer just about disclosure, but was about disclosure and action. And I think the action is the important part because that's where you know, our uh, industry is at, uh, partially brown uh, in all shades, and we need to move towards their green pathways. And there's lots of things that is on the InRev agenda in terms of um, guidelines around sustainability that we will introduce a new module, uh, data collection on the asset level, so we can link uh, the performance data to the sustainability data as well to help you as an industry to move forward and have greater transparency in decision making. So uh, I think this is definitely a call for action and the market is hearing. Great. Serge, you wanted to come in on that. Yeah, just picking up on this, uh, it's uh, it's very interesting uh, because I, I truly believe that it's uh, it's already in a, a very concrete topic. Um, it's not only plans, we are seeing it really uh, every day. Uh, I think the, the ESG agenda, uh, I mentioned that it was pushing to, uh, to uh, maybe even more fly to quality on the asset side. I think from a banking perspective, uh, it also uh, goes with a flight to, um, to, uh, to, to, to work with maybe more institutional uh, players, uh, people who have maybe uh, deeper pockets, who have the means to do, uh, to, do uh, to transform uh, assets and, uh, and can have a, a more developed ESG uh, strategy. Uh, so I think this might have also an impact in um, the type of investors that we, uh, we want to follow. Maybe we, we follow more institutional uh, investors uh, in the coming years. Who have the means to to put in place the DSG uh, strategy and uh, and maybe link to that one of the the big trends uh, started already in 2021 and uh, which we obviously uh, continue. We are more and more asked to uh, to provide green loans, so uh, that's that's a very uh, strong trend on, on our side. I mean, I received requests for financing with uh, with green uh, green um, green loan. Uh, aspect uh, several times last year and it, it continues this year so it's uh, one of the the, the big trend also uh, which will uh, which will continue great thanks Ash. um it'd be interesting just to drill down a little bit in terms of the um sectors um we talked a little bit about logistics already um but residential anything around living has been one of the the key topics of 2021 and going into 2022 particularly affordable housing. Um, does anybody want to pick up in terms of the trends that they're seeing there, particularly on that living sector? I'd be happy to take a stab at that. Um, I think then if we separate out areas which are um, sort of healthy from a structural and healthy from a cyclical perspective versus structural. So structural stressed might be residential. Um, structural healthy, absolutely uh, industrial. Cyclical stressed might be hotels and then cyclical healthy is absolutely multifamily at the moment. So it's a cyclical, in my view at the moment, it's cyclical in terms of multifamily. US multifamily transaction volumes are up, they've doubled. You know, is they're up like 128% on last year. Um, and I think on the year before, they're, they're basically they're almost doubled on what they were back in 2019. So there is a massive push in terms of US family liquidity. Um, here in Europe, I think the numbers are up 67%. So there was a particularly large deal which has pushed that its numbers up on Volnovio. Um, but generally, like many institutional real estate investors, we're looking at partially from an ESG perspective, what can we do as an institutional investor around social housing? Um, we've done three billion um, euros into the global residential sector in 2021. Um, some of that was social housing in Germany. Some of it is into housing platforms in the Nordics. Some of it is Japan multifamily, which is quite a big area for us. And then the other new trend in the US is single family housing. So multifamily, generally apartment blocks, but in the US, the newer trend is for single 
family housing um, on sort of built complexes and we're working with the JV partner over there. So it, it's a big area um, in terms of what people are looking for. I think one of the sort of flags on the horizon actually is inflation in that in periods of very high inflation, governments will often seek to put on rent caps. So as much as we say that real estate is a hedge against inflation and all the numbers I gave you earlier are all on office markets where governments generally don't get involved in rent caps, but in residential governments will get involved in rent caps in high inflationary periods. So I think it's just something to watch going forward. Um, it's great that institutional investors are helping to add to the housing stock helping to provide new and better quality housing. But there's just from an investment perspective, this flag on the horizon around inflation when it comes to residential returns. Um, and Irina, are you seeing anything in terms of the, the sort of more niche elements of that, that that may also pick up on that, on the S side of, of ESG in a way, the, the more impact side? So healthcare, um, student housing, obviously we've talked about, but healthcare, senior living, um, life sciences, those kinds of elements. Yeah, I mean, the point I was making earlier about the expansion of the universe, uh, this is exciting part in the marketplace because we now see more sectors and more specialist sectors coming in and being in demand by investors and also already in pre-planning. So, you know, specialist sectors, um, which are perhaps still small in stock, like the life sciences in Europe, are expected to come onto the pipeline in the near future and investors are already preparing for that. So I think in the next decade or so, the universe of investable stock in terms of sector choice and diversification will really be even more interesting uh, than it is today. But when it comes to residential in general, in, it's in a very firm, strong position. It was actually in the shared first position last year. And this year it's in the third position, but only marginally with industrial logistics in first pos uh, position in Europe, uh, offices in the second and residential in a strong third. And we could talk about offices a little bit because I think that's where things are interesting. But I will pause for a moment um, just in, uh, for the other uh, specialists to, to share their views. Uh, no, that's good. Um, let's let's because we've only got around four minutes left. So let's let's pick up a little bit on offices. Um, <clears throat> give your view on that, Arena. And then what I'm going to do is is ask everybody uh, what's their sort of key trend and 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 I suppose key opportunity that they see. But, but it'd be interesting to get your take on office, certainly. Yes, the reason I brought up the office it's obvious one because of course we've been through all sorts of different ways of working in the last few years since the COVID began. And that really comes through in the latest investment intentions results. We see a lack of consensus in terms of how different investors see offices. And I think that's very interesting. So if I start with the global picture uh, in terms of global allocations in the next two years, uh, Asia Pacific investors and European investors on average are looking to allocate about 25%. So I think that's quite a a decent allocation uh, given the things, uh, state of things. The North American investors are a bit more pessimistic, and I know Megan has some observations on that market. They are on average at 10% uh, uh, allocations to the office. But the spread in terms of European investors in the interest towards the sector is significant. It's at about 60%, 90th percentile, and 10% a tenth percentile. So, you know, the different positions that different investors are taking when it comes to offices globally is quite uh, sparse and uh, varies significantly. It's a little bit more clearer for Europe what we see in terms of both rent received versus rent receivable. I think the office market has held up quite well, so around 90% mark, which is actually not too dissimilar to industrial and logistics. And actually from the investment sentiment survey, which we do specifically for Europe and on a quarterly basis, just to have that frequency, we saw in December results, offices actually rising in need in allocations by investors in 2022 uh, to about 40%. So there is a sentiment for European offices, which is showing a clear upward trajectory. Okay, great, really interesting. Um, 
I knew that trying to tackle the, the whole world in an hour was probably tricky. Um, but what it does suggest to me is that we need to do this on a sort of quarterly basis, maybe, because I think some of those trends that we're seeing um, in terms of capital, but also uh, investor intentions and allocations are really interesting to be able to compare what's happening in Asia and the US with what's happening here in Europe as well. Um, so just a quick kind of 20 seconds now from each for you, I suppose, 30 seconds um, on what you see as I suppose you can either choose your, your biggest trend or the biggest opportunity um, that you see for 2022. Um, let's let's start with you, Thomas, um, just uh, just just for your kind of final view on that. Yeah, I, I would I would clearly focus on the transformational part of our industry. So the value add approach, I think, makes sense. Transformation into ESG, having a focus, uh, the new types of living and working that would be by my my best bet for the future if it's directly real estate or is it linked to a prop tech investment in combination that's i think where we can make great great returns great thank you irina i will echo what thomas has said uh, because i think that's about almost a change of mindset uh, of the industry and that transitioning uh, whether it comes to the esg and repurposing and repositioning or uh, incorporating the operational aspects in recognition that you can also create outperformance by reducing costs and you can do so by increasing ESG efficiencies as well. Uh, and the other part which I've touched on uh, uh, already is the expansion of investable universe, not only from the sector perspective, but also from the vehicle type perspective. For example, we see doubling of non-European real estate debt funds in terms of size over the last uh, six years or so. Great, thank you, Serge. Yeah, I think uh, the, the, in terms of volumes, uh, from our perspective, uh, the, the, the office sector will remain the, the, the main um, asset class that we will uh, look at with a strong focus on, uh, on ESG topics, obviously. So we, um, we will see uh, maybe a lot of uh, developments Pre-led developments because the, the speculative developments are still uh, difficult to finance uh, currently. Um, and then the other uh, asset classes that will be um, on top is, uh, is the logistics um, asset class and the residential, I would say. The strong focus, obviously, on the SG agenda. And as I mentioned earlier, on given the, the low yield environment remaining within uh, conservative LTVs and um, maybe uh, the development of more, more mezzanine uh, uh, actors that we, we, we might maybe see uh, next year. Great, thanks very much. And uh, Megan, last word to you. Thanks. I would suggest that we look in cities that have got the best bars and nightclubs, because I think we've all been locked up for a long time. I think we'd like to go back to cities with the best bars and nightclubs with public transport systems. So offices, and decent residential in the heart of cities with the best bars and nightclubs. That's what I'd be buying. Hooray for that, Megan. What a, what a, what a very good end to, that is. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, uh, I mentioned, uh, there was a mention also around the, um, the focus on Russia and Ukraine. Um, and it would be interesting, if you're interested in that, do have a look at Marek Matraszek's um, presentation that he did on CE last week, um, because that has some really interesting uh, sections around um, the, the sort of political side in, in terms of uh, Russia, the US um, and Ukraine. So that, that's worth picking up on demand if, if, if you're more interested in that topic as well. Um, thanks very much for joining us. Um, thank you, all of the speakers. Really interesting. Thank you for your, um, for your questions and your comments. Um, the next sessions that we've got are going to be on um, life sciences and precision medicine um, next week. So a look at that, which is a growing area, and also on the uh, on the Netherlands markets. So those are on the 8th and 9th next week. Um, so do join us for those if you're interested in those topics. Uh, in the meantime, um, thanks very much to all of the speakers. Thanks to you. Um, and if you are watching this on demand, thank you for watching. Thanks very much, everybody. <laughs>